Business and Local Government Data Research Centre. Bringing data to life. Exploring data. Enhancing knowledge. Empowering society. Thank you everyone and um, thanks Emma for the introduction. Um, so today, um, as Emma said, we're talking about a really interesting topic of the power of social media um, to use as an early warning system for the NHS, potentially to predict, prevent and protect the public. Um, as well as obviously using the HDM hashtag, we always like people to follow us online where you can find out all the latest on our research, whether it's publications, free events and much more that we offer. Uh, you can find us at BLG Data Research. I'm going to quickly go through today's agenda and then I'll be handing it over to our expert who will be giving you all the details on uh, the data analytics side of things and the, the reason you're really here today. So I'll be talking briefly about the centre, uh, the wider support we can provide. Um, we'll be giving you a bit of background, uh, go through a number of case studies, really interesting case studies. And then we'll be doing a live Q&A at the end. Now we, as the Business and Local Government Data Research Centre, support organisations across the UK. That includes the NHS, from commissioners to providers, through to businesses and the voluntary sector, use data more effectively. We provide completely free support. If you have a project or an idea, or issue with data, we really have the passion and also the research capabilities to combine fundamental research with applied to change policies and improve practice. So you may be wondering, how do we do that? And we've got three core principles that we use to do that. One of them is exploring data. The way that we do that is through something called a data analytics innovation voucher, or as we like to call them, a DAVE. And yes, it may be a TV channel, it's also a lovely character, but what we're talking about is um, a, a voucher, so a, a fund, to bring one of your projects to life using the expertise of our data analytics um, senior research officers, who could undertake a research project of choice for you um, and that's all funded under our scheme. Also new to 2021 is the data science and AI project placement. This is where we will take the brightest students from the University of Essex, the future leaders in data science and artificial intelligence to take on a project. It's a rapid funding round where they will be placed with you completely free of charge um, for six weeks to bring your project to life um, and we always welcome uh, submissions for interesting projects where our um, aspiring data scientists and, and artificial intelligence experts can come in and, and really undertake that so these two are um, as we mentioned the funding to you to bring one of those projects um, to fruition and also the research expertise to deliver the work and also help you come up with a solution at the end because ultimately only using data and using information can you make more informed decisions i'm going to share um, a case study with you and i was so torn between which case study to use because we have so many amazing ones um, and my background is the NHS. I come from the NHS commissioning background um, and I wanted to choose an NHS one, but then I thought, no, I'm going to share one that perhaps you haven't heard of, which is East Sussex Highways. Now, East Sussex Highways came to us because they had a lot of data they were collecting and they wanted to service roads more effectively and using their data, we delivered a project which created an algorithm that had the ability to predict potholes before they even occur. 
Now, we all know potholes are the bane of every driver's life, that and possibly traffic. Um, and we created an algorithm to predict those potholes. As a result, this highway service is able to now understand where the deterioration of pathways and roads is going to occur, uh, allocate funding more effectively, and fill in and service those road, uh, roads, reducing complaints, saving time, and saving money. Now imagine if we could use that same principle of predictive analytics to help overcome or predict the decline in mental health. Mental health is uh, prevalent, so prevalent in the UK, one in four people suffering. It costs uh, the NHS millions of pounds. Now imagine if we could use the same approach to data analytics to protect people, to catch them before they fall. This is one of the areas that uh, data analytics and pre predictive analytics can support. There are many others too. Um, now, when it comes to enhancing knowledge, we can do this for a range of workshops. Uh, many of them took place face-to-face -face before the pandemic, but we hope to deliver more face-to-face -face ones next year. So watch out for those. They could be on all sorts of topics, so from social media to uh, hands-on in the lab training sessions too. And ultimately, our core aim is empowering society. We close the gap between academia and policy. We want to make a, a radical change in the UK. So with that being said, if you, um, I'm going to hand you over to our expert for today, who will be talking you through um, today's presentation, social media as a great tool for the NHS, um, gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lizza. Her, her areas of specialism are artificial intelligence and um, many other areas too. Um, she is a former researcher for our centre um, and now she is working at the University of East Anglia um, using machine learning. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over to her for the really exciting topic today. Um, and so thank you all for listening. If you want to find out more about the centre and how we can help you specifically through one or more of our grant funded schemes, whether that's training in data analytics or whether you've got a project that you need help with, please do contact me at the end because um, we can help you there too. So over to you, Fahana, thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, so, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Looks okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Laura, for for this uh, nice introduction, and uh, thank you, um, uh, Emma, for uh, managing this session. Um, so, as Laura said, uh, I was a researcher at the center. We worked on different projects, um, but now I'm a lecturer at the uh, University of East Anglia uh, with um, Department of Computing Sciences. So, my research is in machine learning, um, AI machine learning, and mainly text uh, mining. Um, I also worked with uh, time series analysis, um, early prediction methods, um, early warning system. And I, I have interest in fundamental and applied research, um, but I also want to interact with um, stakeholders, uh, public sectors uh, to make an impact. Uh, today, we are going to discuss about early warning systems uh, for, uh, for NHS. And today's agenda is uh, quite general, uh, but uh, we'll be specifically discussing um, how we can develop an early warning systems uh, for several scenarios. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities we have? And what complexities we have to deal with? So uh, today morning, I had we had actually in UAE we had a meeting with the chief constable of Suffolk Police, and we are discussing about early warning system for 
domestic abuse cases where some of the cases results in uh, fatal uh, incidents. So it's, a, it's quite challenging um, and I will describe many issues uh, around this. Uh, but there are also some good scenarios where um, we could uh, make a good impact. So what is an early warning system? So some of the adverse outcomes um, are often uh, preceded by abnormal vital signs or known patterns. So we, we know that something we can predict probably two weeks earlier, two months earlier, or two years earlier than an incident uh, actually happens. So it's all about learning the patterns which can lead to a fatal incident. Um, there are many, situ many uh, situations where it can be beneficial. So one of the situation is um, early detection of or understanding that a medication would result in an adverse uh, incident or it would give you adverse reaction. Uh, there are also situations like where people are using a medication for, for years, but it doesn't really have um, the, the expected effects that, that drugs should bring. And then we also describe a situation where suicide can be predicted, uh, which is a very, very challenging uh, scenarios, uh, but there are still some um, hope to do something in using, using AI and machine learning techniques. In all these situations, social media opens up a, a situation where we can um, use data shared by people and we can use those data with some other control system to make those predictions sustainable. So I will describe all those things um, in, in following slides. So adverse reaction has been a um, burden for NHS uh, to start with uh, because a lot of adverse reactions results in a hospital admission uh, for adults and for children. So there are studies uh, where they showed like 6.5% um, uh, of the hospital admissions are actually generated from there. There are also some adverse reactions resulted in, in fatal uh, situation where death happens. And it's it burdens NHS a couple of, these statistics are from a couple of years ago current situation might be uh, might be worse or might be slightly better. Um, but it was like uh, we are talking about millions of pounds that just uh, happened because of these adverse reactions. There is another issue around this adverse reaction is public trust and compliance. So for example, for COVID-19, when we had a few adverse reaction, uh, people started questioning, shall we take that? Uh, vaccine or not. But we all know that no one actually is safe un unless everyone is safe. So this also adverse reaction makes people not taking a medication, for example, on drugs. So in UK, we have this YOLO card scheme. Um, so it's a form-based uh, process where um, a doctor, a, a patient, um, clinical, um, specialists, they can fill this up to report a uh, adverse reaction of a, or suspected side effect of a medicine. The problem with this is, I would say, it's twofold. First thing, um, psychologically, it seems like a formal process. And many people don't really like to fill up a form. And secondly, it's an isolated process. Uh, because sometimes adverse reactions are not well understood. So people, uh, specifically this is true for rare, rare uh, disease or for, um, for a new drugs, for example. So if someone is feeling, feeling bad, 
Is it because of uh, the disease or is it because of the adverse reaction of the medication? So sometimes people don't really, because it's an isolated process, people don't really understand like, is it, shall we go for reporting, uh, reporting it? Only 2.4% of these uh, reactions are now reported using this uh, process, which is not good enough. And only 10% of the seriously, seriously suspected um, adverse reaction are actually reported. So this also like a statistics tells us people don't really use it or there are reasons that they don't really like this process. Let's take a poll at this at this state like do you really use yellow card scheme to log your minor adverse reactions so we're gonna um, there's a quick poll you can use it and please let me know when uh, the poll is ended Okay, so that's really interesting. 67% of you have uh, never used this, uh, this, this scheme for reporting uh, adverse reaction, and 33% of you said sometimes. That's really interesting to know that sometimes you have used this poll. Um, let's now talk, look at the situation where there is a serious adverse reactions. Let's take another poll. Uh, same question, but if this is the case where this, the reaction is really, really serious. Okay, the second poll is uh, quite interesting. So now 25% of you are saying that you have used this scheme for uh, reporting serious adverse reactions. 50% are saying never, and 25% are saying sometimes. Um, so at this case, if I may ask you, and if you want, you can uh, share in chat, like why you didn't use it? What are the reason that you never used used it you never had to or you had to but you didn't know or you don't like a uh, form filling sy system w what are the reasons behind it so um european union's uh, innovative medicine initiatives web rudder they uh, there is a three years uh, of uh, uh, work was done to investigate if the social media data can be used to understand uh, adverse reactions and uh, can be can be developed something uh, in better. So there is one of the app uh, is an outcome of that project. It's a yellow card app. So one of the motivation was because people don't like filling up forms and this uh, it's a formal process, but usually we like to use an app. It's a much more uh, informal way of uh, reporting and probably easier. So if you look at the rating of this app, it's 2.5 out of 5, which is not a, a very good indication. Um, 
seems like there are reasons people don't like it. So at this stage, I would ask you a third poll, and this is the last poll. Do you use this yellow card app that is developed by Web Rudder? Okay, so 100% of you, now none of you has actually used this app. Um, is there the reason you didn't know about it or it's just you didn't like it? So you probably can answer this question in the chat if you like. Um, so we have looked into some of the reviews of the uh, publicly available reviews of the web radar system just to see if, is if, if this is a uh, fit for uh, purpose. So what we have seen in the reports is that so people find it very poor, the app uh, they found is quite poor. Uh, they are saying that it's, it's kind of navigation of this app was not up to the standard. They find it very difficult to navigate. It takes far too long for something, which is which should be quite serious. And um, basically, they are saying it needs to be simpler and quicker to use. Then another one is saying uh, another re review is saying that someone is 53 years old and that app wants to be clicked 636 times to access his birth birth date. So that that kind of in flexibility in the app, people find it very difficult to use. There is another one is saying, um, basically it's not fit for purpose because of the performance is not really, uh, really, really good. And there are, uh, it's slow. So this is, uh, these are like some of the reviews that we looked into. There is another app uh, that was quite uh, kind of, uh, I would say, they performed better than the uh, yellow card app, which is COVID symptom study app. So this is a project, uh, this is done in UK, and it is a collaboration between university, King's College University, um, St. Thomas's Hospital, and um, a health science uh, organizations called JOI. Uh, so they collaboratively developed this one during the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. So that time, that one, that app is actually quite uh, successful because they have the rating of 4.7 and also like a lot of people are using it. If you look at the number that people has uh, provided reviews. This app has a couple of benefit over the other ones. Uh, first of all, it was developed only for um, one purposes. It's uh, for COVID-19 symptoms, and it was quite, um, it's, it's not dealing with uh, multiple disease or multiple uh, medications. And it also has uh, the design that's been quite robust. It was better usable. Um, multiple people could actually access the app without uh, uh, experiencing any kind of delay in navigation. So the design was better, better usability. And it was available to the large, uh, large population for all the UK um, residents. Let's look at some of the reviews of this app. So although they tried 
uh, to make it robust and the uh, system design was quite careful. Uh, but still, uh, people are saying that the buttons goes gray, but doesn't load the next page. But usually it's a, it's a five star. So usually it works fine, but sometimes it doesn't work. So it, it tells about tells us when a system been used by many, many uh, people, uh, the scalability is an issue. And when we start looking at like slowing down, we are just looking at gray, it doesn't go to the next page and so on. Uh, and again, this is one of the main issues with this app, like they are looking at some of the questions and they are quite inflexible. So can't say haven't had or get past this. So that the scenario wasn't considered. So it was not in the app. Without giving that information, you cannot go to the next page, basically. So there are still room for improvement. So again, the similar situation, like it would not get let, let you go to the next page without answering a specific question, even though you might not have this. But uh, Joey Global was quite uh, prompt in terms of um, answering questions and there are rapid updates of the app and that makes it a little bit more better support than other apps. So what we really need from this from these three scenarios, uh, one thing is uh, quite clear that we need a system which is very easy to use and because there are multiple people will be accessing this app or the server uh, if we go to the computer science and computer science world because there is a client server architecture. So if there are many people are trying to use the server, then it has to be scalable and it has to be robust. So it should not show us like I can't go to the next page. Uh, because it's really slow or something like this. Also, it says that um, when you give a, when you develop a system which is uh, easier to use, people will use it. And in, in, in the COVID symptom analysis where they have to provide information about uh, different health uh, issues and what symptoms they are facing, and they shared the, those information. We also want something where we can smartly annotate those data. So once when someone has collected the data, we also have to annotate them to be able to use those data for a machine learning system or an automated system to give a prediction. So when we Talk, to, talk about prediction, that means we want to predict something will happen before it happens, right? So that's that in that situation, this scenario, we are uh, discussing the predictions, uh, prediction in that sense. So this is one, one way that controlled data collections can be done, can be analyzed, can be um, get more insights about uh, a situation, uh, drugs and medications and uh, patient health. Um, but also on the other hand, we have a large publicly available data sets. So now people are using social media more than ever. So if you look at these statistics, 3.96 billion people currently use social media. And this actually from a couple of, um, if we compare this with a couple of, uh, couple of years back, uh, it was almost double. And an and, and average person usually have 8.6, uh, more than eight social media accounts. Like they have different social media associations. So this also tells us there is a lot of data available where people share their uh, experience on medications, on uh, on on other things in in social media platforms, but there's the problem with the social media data is that not all posts are created equal. Some of them are a lot of noise, and extracting those very relevant information from those noise is quite a challenge. So if we talk about Twitter data, for example, 
1% of random sample is publicly available. Um, people can extract them. Um, people can use them for research purposes. There are different uh, frameworks in place for using them. The problem is um, there are millions of tweets and extracting most relevant one for a for an application is extremely extremely difficult uh, situation so data imbalance because lots of irrelevant data and very few related data that's that's generates and data imbalance and that makes most of the machine learning algorithms to struggle with giving a good prediction about the situation we have been working with uh, research questions around it. Uh, we, I have paper on it, like how we can actually deal with this situation, uh, like uh, how we actually can use those imbalanced data to develop an algorithm which would work. So what we basically need is an integrated system, probably. So where at one part we'd have some controlled a data collection method utilizing some uh, app where the app is robust, scalable, and easy to use. And we also can attach this system with another system where it will collect data from social media and it will clean those data, remove those nuances, find a very uh, noble and efficient uh, annotation technique so that we can use this in an, as an integrated system. So it requires an uh, appropriate infrastructure and also it requires machine learning algorithms that would fit for uh, that, that situation. So as we know data dilemmas is always there, um, we have to deal with consistency, we have to deal with quantity, quality, and format, and also which data we actually can use, like which data uh, doesn't have any kind of data sharing agreement issues. The integrated system, which uh, because NHS has access to a lot of information already, there are uh, many drugs and many symptoms are there, so we are talking about a very large infrastructure. Social media data has to be uh, collected properly. Um, it has to filter properly. It has to annotate properly. And it has to be integrated in a way which would talk to this control system uh, with a very effortless way. And if we can show that, that a user might develop an adverse reaction based on uh, user history of uh, health history and also information that we know more about from social media where a similar, similar patient has experienced something using the similar medication, then it will uh, increase the uh, human engagement with this system. So an easy to use system, efficient, interactive and engaging app. This is what we are looking at. So I will show some case studies where uh, machine learning has been used successfully and it has some of the, um, the challenges they actually uh, recovered from. So this is a uh, first uh, case study involves our COVID symptom app. So they use logistic regression model at the, at the, in their base, but it's also, it was scalable. There are uh, lots of people have used this app and self-reported their symptoms. And most importantly, this app could actually identify hotspots two weeks before the situation get worse. So they use those map, this map, to uh, to go with government with uh, with uh, with NHS to find out how they can allocate their resources uh, because if if certain areas would get um, more patient because of COVID symptoms or because of their uh, prediction, then NHS can 
actually um, increase their resources in those areas. And they could do it two weeks prior to a incident uh, start getting worse. So this is one of the examples I, I found quite uh, fascinating. The second one, uh, a situation where uh, it's a community website, patient like me. So what they have done is um, there are around 830K uh, patients in that platform and they have more than uh, 3,000 uh, different conditions. So this platform gives a way to discuss with each other uh, about a condition, how the medication is working for them, how they are feeling. Um, they, there are research work based on those data. And then also like pharmaceutical companies, they can uh, look into this data to see uh, how their drugs are actually uh, working. So based on this one, there is a one research paper uh, where Nature Biotechnology has published where they found lithium actually had no effect on the progression of ALS. So there's a disease and lithium was found is actually ineffective. So this is one of the way where they could find like unproven treatment using public data sets. So one of the good thing, uh, the good side of this uh, community website is there are more than 800K people um, using that platform, sharing their information, getting benefit from, uh, from each other, knowing that how they're feeling. It, it's no longer an isolated process. Pharmaceutical companies can use this data to improve their uh, medication. Also academics or researchers can use this data to analyze more. So this is one of the, one of the, um, one of the examples uh, where we see the benefit of social media data sets and how uh, this integration uh, can, can make us, make everyone get benefit from. Um, detecting suicidality is, is one of the issues in, in the world. So there are 16 million uh, suicide attempts and 800K people actually died from those attempts. It's extremely difficult to find out someone's behavioral change or someone would uh, attempt to uh, take their own life. Even very expert clinicians they struggle to find out those early signals because it's one of the issues is that the patient have to say that they are thinking to take their life, which is um, in many cases, it doesn't happen. Uh, but one of the bright side is from a text mining perspective. If we analyze Twitter, for example, Twitter post, and for for it for a couple of um, time periods for a person, we can actually uh, see the their mental deterioration through their through their post. So using text mining approaches, it is possible to um, kind of um, find out if someone's mental health is actually getting worse and if someone might. Um, commit uh, to suicidal attempt. It's a difficult, uh, uh, it's not very easy, but it, there are work has been done where content analysis was done, then clinical methods was incorporated with that analysis. There are deep learning methods has been used. One of the AI technique where the very complex uh, algorithms were applied to extract and knowledge from the textual data. And then uh, it was sent it to a suicidal ideation detection. And then once we can extract some of the exam, um, some of the patient who, or some of the people who have, um, who are actually, um, their mental health is kind of deteriorating, 
then further human in the loop can be incorporated. And then that expert clinician can go through for, with more qualitative analysis and give prescription so that uh, the, uh, the intervention can be done in a, in a, in a timely manner. So last situation is that um, the currently we have this nice, uh, uh, the changes their regulation, like guidelines is updated in five years time. It's a quite a long time for a medic, uh, some of the situation might get really bad. Some people might take their life. Some people might, uh, might uh, get, does not get this proper intervention because it's just quite long time. So probably a integrated system might help to reduce this delay of guideline updates. So that's all uh, basically uh, case studies I wanted to discuss today. So what's next for social media use in healthcare? So in my opinion, first one is to, we need two system. One is a control system where we know the users we know what uh, their symptoms are and we know everything about it but they will be sharing data so one of the examples is like yamar so in in uae we have like a umr community uh, websites where when students get enrolled in a course they can they are automatically enrolled to that uh, community um, services and then they can share their problems like if they are finding something uh, some modules are difficult they can discuss those if they are uh, want to help they they can discuss all about everything there are some ground rules that they have to follow we can we can have we, if we have something like this for nhs where people will willingly uh, post their situations and then just they, they will discuss about different medication they are taking, what side effects they are experiencing, is it a minor, is it a major, and how they are feeling about it. It would not be an isolated process anymore. And then we need like a public domain, public um, social media post, uh, where we have to find a very um, state of the art way of uh, into, uh, extracting data, annotating data, and this integrated system would give a very good understanding about what is going on for each patient. We need infrastructure. We are talking about a very big infrastructure and also algorithmic development to be able to, able to do this. We need right treatment for right patient and right time. So that's the three things is our main target. So we want to find these three, three elements to work together. So now I will hand it over to Laura uh, to just uh, tell us about her final notes, and then I will I'll take your questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Fahana. That, that was really interesting, and I think we'll all agree that there is so much opportunity um, that we could take advantage of to really use this untapped source of data to help. Um, in many different areas of the NHS and healthcare in general. Um, now, I wanted to just bring to light the other opportunities we've got. If this if this webinar has inspired you um, and you have a project in mind or are collecting some data and, and need some help or support to really analyse it, whether that's predictive analytics like we've spoken about today or any other method, uh, please do get in touch because you could be eligible for a data analytics innovation voucher you may wish to apply to have um, a student, a master's student, uh, be placed with you. Uh, you may want to do some training yourself in data analytics, and in which case we can take care of that. Um, and also to find out more about our workshops, events and challenge labs. So thank you again. Don't forget to follow us online. You'll find us on all the usual channels. Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I will put a recording of this webinar um, on our YouTube channel as well. I know it's going to go onto the HTN website, which is also great. So over to the Q&A. I've actually had a couple of questions come through to me. 
Um, so, um, Emma, if there are any in the chat, do let me know. And if not, I'll um, read a couple out that I've already got here. Thank you. Um, I haven't got any come through on the chat, so if you wanted to just go through the ones that you've got, that'd be great. Sure, no problem. Okay, so this one is um, for Fahana, and it is, mm -hmm. in your research so far, do you feel that Twitter is the most uh, reliable social media platform um, for predictive analytics when it comes to health? Or do you think that one of the newer emerging platforms such as WhatsApp, um, or TikTok or any others could be more beneficial? Uh, thank you, Laura, for this question. It's actually actually a great question because um, we have uh, lots of research going on with Twitter datasets. Uh, the main reason is it has this um, one person data that uh, you can uh, basically extract, you can download, uh, you can uh, do analysis and uh, it's publicly available, right? As long as you don't disclose, uh, disclose any um, anyone's private information, um, that's fine. But Twitter also have many issues. Like, uh, as I said, there are lots of irrelevant uh, posts for an application. So it makes data very imbalanced. So the related or relevant information might be very few compared to uh, lots of uh, data we have. But still, compared to the other, um, Twitter is still the best uh, way we can extract information, get some idea about public opinion. For example, if we're looking at population level um, interaction, then Twitter is still the best platform. But I would say for NHS, uh, we need, as I said in the, in, the, in the talk, we need something like an integrated system where we have access to some very a quality data where there are control environment like app can be there and data can be collected using an app. People will be uh, giving information in an informed way. And then we can also use those public data from the Twitter to enhance the performance of those apps. So are you um, basically saying that it would be a, a, like a multifaceted approach to, to really getting the most 360 degree look, I suppose, at, at health and predictive analytics. Yes. We can't just rely on one source. So I think that's really interesting. Um, we've had yeah. another question as well, um, which was submitted. Um, and it is, do you think, or how would you overcome, I suppose, more than anything, the demographic split that you find on social media? For example, the demographics of Twitter users is very different to the demographics of Instagram. Thank you for that yeah. question. Have a good one there. Yeah, exactly. I I understand this uh, situation because um, th that's why we need an integrated system. Uh, so where we know that what kind of data we are collecting, what kind of user we have, we have information about those um, uh, users' uh, demography explicitly, and those are like gold data. And uh, from the Twitter, we can still collect uh, data from very diverse demographic and probably more biased diagraphic if, you would, if, if we are looking at some particular uh, application area. But then combining them is also uh, only, uh, when, I, when I look at this problem, the combining them, these two situation, is, is provide us the solution. Thank you. I think that's really interesting that a lot of food for thought there. Um, I think particularly the the um, case study around the suicide um, really, I just think that it has so much potential if, if we can collaborate more with academia and the NHS to, to make sure that these academic skills are, are used to, to make a real difference where they're needed most. So thank you, Vana. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Laura. Uh, so I just want to add, because as I said, today we have another meeting uh, with the uh, Norfolk Police. And what they said, like they have lots of data they have been collecting 
and they also want to uh, have some kind of machine learning techniques to automate their decision making although there is a human in in the loop but they also want to do an automated part to make it just efficient i think it is it is time it's a good time for all of us to think about how some of the part of the analysis uh, decision making can we automate it and social media data gives us this opportunity to learn uh, from diverse population uh, the only difficulties is how to collect those data and how to annotate those data efficiently intelligently and um, as i said in this talk i mean if you have any question please get in touch in my email or contact laura we will be uh, she will uh, uh, arrange a meeting but we can discuss this more if there is an application area you have in mind uh, that why we can apply this machine learning technique and uh, do something uh, um, positive impact for the society thank you very much thank you and thank you everyone for listening today Thank, Thank you very much for your presentation, guys. It's really great. Um, if you do have any questions, like they said, you can send them over to them or you can send them over to us at press at htn.co.uk and then we'll forward them on to Laura and Fahana. Uh, thank you for your presentation and thank you to everyone for joining us for this presentation and the earlier sessions we had today. Um, if you did miss any of them or did you, if you wanted to re-watch them, you can find the write-ups and recordings over on the HTN website later today. So thank you very much, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Laura. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Business and Local Government Data Research Centre. Bringing data to life. Exploring data. Enhancing knowledge. Empowering society. Whether you are a business, charity or public sector organisation, we can help you use data to improve your work. Find out more about our free support online, visit blgdataresearch.org or click the link in the description.